Welcome to Plants for Your Arizona Yard, brought to you by the Town of Gilbert Water Conservation Office. So one of the things we think about here in the Arizona desert, we want to know what our landscapes do for us. And one of the great things they're going to do is provide shade. So this does a couple great things. It does cool the area from our hot Arizona summers. And you can actually use this to do some passive energy conservation. And done right, you can reduce your energy bills anywhere from 24 to 42%. Now, one thing when you're doing this, you do wanna make sure you know your seasonal sun exposure because it does change a lot between winter where you'll see the north side of that house is getting zero sun at any time of the day compared to summer when that sun starts rising further in the north and setting further in the north. So now a much smaller area on the north side of that house is actually being uh, shaded. So we also want our uh, landscapes to provide some beauty. And that's a wonderful thing is we have many, many plants that do a great job of giving us all sorts of color. So we've got all our different flowering shrubs out here that are low water use. They're beautiful, they provide excellent color. The other thing that our landscapes are gonna do for us is we can provide some texture out there and that's another wonderful thing about the available plant choices here in our region is you can get all sorts of great textures with your different cacti and things like that. Another part where we can provide some beauty in your yard is with some form where we've got a lot of these plants that have these great structural elements and they really draw and captivate the eye, whether it's those flowering agave stalks or the iconic saguaro native to our Sonoran Desert. The other thing our landscapes will do for us is actually provide recreational areas and you may be surprised to see a photo of some grass in this presentation. But one thing you have to remember is grass is the only plant material that you can actually tolerate foot traffic. So if you want a play area either for kids or dogs, having a nice small piece of grass where it's actually going to be played on is not a bad thing. The other thing we can do with our landscapes is provide food and habitat especially for a lot of the birds that we like to draw in, especially those hummingbirds. People love to see hummingbirds and we've got a lot of great varieties here and you can be sure to check out our other presentation specifically about plants that will attract your butterflies and hummingbirds. So it'll also provide food and habitat, like I said, for the uh, butterflies as well. So the other thing we can do with our landscapes is to provide some screening so it can give us a little bit of privacy it can actually help blend your house into the neighborhood rather than just a big building sticking out of the street and also give yourself some privacy from neighbors. <clears throat> now also when they're talking about landscaping, it's not just all about plants. We do wanna think about our hardscape areas. So we're thinking about all the different areas where we may have our patios, our fireplaces, our fire pits, and of course our barbecue areas. With our wonderful climate here, we can spend a lot of time of the year outside enjoying our area. So make sure you put these into your plan as well. <clears throat> so a lot of people that are new here will wonder, well, what can I grow here? And plan choice is a personal decision, but we do have to remember we're not in Kansas anymore and you're probably not gonna be very successful trying to grow that hosta here. So one thing you do wanna do, if it's a brand new yard, you wanna make sure you start with a plan. So go ahead and uh, check with your Xeriscape brochure. This is where these uh, different images are coming from. So go ahead and draw the yard to scale and definitely make several copies. So if you can make some changes, you can kind of go back and forth and decide which one you actually like. So decide on your area functions, what you want to do. Think about the areas where you do want to provide that shade. Think about those areas where you do need pathways to get uh, from one side of the yard to the other. Definitely consider those play areas and those entertainment areas as well. So that way it's a one cohesive plan rather than just all these hodgepodge of different areas that really don't seem to be uh, one cohesive plan. So what we do here is when we do these low water use yards, we do uh, have what we call a Xeriscape and it is pronounced Xeriscape. And there are actually seven principles to Xeriscape. So first one is of course planning and design. <clears throat> Uh, low water use plants, not necessarily all water use, low water use plants, but definitely the majority of your plants uh, should be regionally appropriate. Uh, think about those grass areas. If you do want some play areas there for the kids or the dogs, uh, do have them appropriate. And what we mean by that is put them where they're actually going to be used. Put them where they'll be played on. 
Typically, you're not seeing people play out in their front yards anymore, so put them in the backyard where they're actually going to be used. Also consider the size. How much room do you actually need for that play area? Efficient irrigation is very, very important to us in our climate because these plants require that supplemental water to actually look good and some of them need it to survive. You're not going to grow a grass lawn on native rainfall here in our area. Think about some of your soil improvements, especially for some of your specialty areas if you're doing some vegetable gardening and things like that. Definitely the use of mulches is one of the principles out there and what that does is it reduces the water use and we do use mulch in all our yards and a lot of people don't realize that that granite is actually a mulch. It's just an inorganic mulch as opposed to what we traditionally think of as a mulch. This one does the same functions. It just doesn't break down and become nutrients for the plant. <clears throat> and appropriate maintenance. So this uh, habit we have of shearing the plants and removing all that foliage does increase the water demand of those plants. So it is xeriscape. That's what we want to have out there as opposed to zero scape. That is a very different yard. It is obviously very low water use, but there's no shading going on. And while whoever put that in is probably very proud of their little brickwork there and showing their love for their spouse, that really isn't much of a landscape. So let's talk about our plant selection there. You do have some great resources out there. One of them is actually online with a searchable database that you can turn into a shopping list, and that's provided by the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association, or AMWA. So the website for that uh, database is amwa.org plants. And that is basically the online version of our hard cover or hard uh, copy brochure that has been out for many, many years and very, very popular, which is landscape plants for the Arizona desert. So one great thing about that brochure is it is more than pretty pictures. People do like to see the pretty pictures of the plants, but when you're designing your yard, you want to make sure you're doing the right plants in the right area. So they provide lots of great information and all that information is also in the online version as well. It just looks a little different than what you'll see in the hard copy brochure. So you're going to see things about how fast they grow, about how big they grow, uh, if they've got flowers, what color they are, what season you're going to see them, uh, any kind of comments where you might have issues with litter or thorns or allergies, we're going to let you know about that, and any special features, especially those ones that draw in things like the hummingbirds and butterflies. <clears throat> so one thing we're doing a pretty good job of uh, in the early days, it was hard to get people convinced of this, but desert plants are not ugly. So you can get a lot of beauty and a lot of color out of these desert plants. Now some of these yards, it may seem a little wild and crazy to some people's taste. You can have a more formal looking landscape if you're not into this uh, wild look. So one of the things we do have to remember here though is poor adaptation is one of the leading causes of plant failure, especially when we think about our hot summers. That poor plant, just no matter how much water we would give it, is just not going to do well in our hot summers. So he has given up the ghost. Now, one thing a lot of people don't seem to remember is you also want to think about sometimes in the winters, we actually do dip down below that freezing mark. So you want to watch out for the frost sensitivity of some of these plants, like the uh, very popular ficus trees out there. They are a high water use tree. Um, they're a nice tree. They're just not well suited here because sooner or later, you're going to have all that frost damage on there that is going to have to be removed. And at that point, it's not really a tree anymore. It's more of a giant shrub. So really, really important when it comes to your plant selection is size matters. You want to make sure you're putting the right plant in the right place as opposed to whatever happened here. That was just not a good idea. That may have just been a volunteer that somebody didn't take care of soon enough. And you can see they had to remove the entire wall to try and get rid of that thing. We also want to think about what's going on with our plant selection is themes and what we want to do is think about our sense of place. So there's a beautiful xeriscape yard. We want to be living in the desert, not in spite of it. So thinking about plant location, you want to think about our exposure or what we often refer to as our microclimates. So you're going to want to know if the plant wants full sun or shade or part shade, things like that. You're also going to think about if you're in a windy location, Think about what kind of plants you're going to put there. They're going to have to be a tougher plant if you're in a windy area. A big one is what we refer to as reflected heat. Think about putting that plant 
right next to those concrete driveways or right up against the west side of the house that gets that afternoon broiling sun. Make sure you're going to pick a plant that's going to tolerate that area. Also think about your plant groupings rather than just individually looking at plants. Think about how they're going to look when they're grouped together. So you can think about different things like the size. Definitely make sure you're putting the larger ones behind the shorter ones from whatever your point of view is. Uh, think also about what you're doing with texture. Definitely think about the flower colors. So you can do a lot of things when you're grouping these plants together. So you're going to think about do I want something using complementary colors where it's going to be a calming cooling effect? Or do you want to use some contrasting colors like these reds and yellows together where they're really going to draw the eye in? And when it comes to grouping and thinking about those flower colors, don't forget about the bloom timing. Make sure if you want things to be providing those impacts like that contrast, make sure you're picking plants that are going to bloom at the same time. So also you want to be planning for the future there. So when this landscape was first put in, all those plants were very, very small. That tree was very small. So definitely think about what it's going to be like at the mature size. Think about the water needs and think about shade, both now and later. So originally where that tree was located, it was not put, providing very much shade when it was first put in the ground. So some plants that really like the sunny areas would do well under there. But later on, as the tree matures, you may want to think about the need to change out those plants to something that will do well in the more shady area. So let's go ahead and take a look at the plants themselves. And first we're going to look at the trees. These are going to be what you put in your landscape first. They're the largest and they provide the most impact, not only for the shade, but also for that energy conservation. So when we're looking at our trees, one of the things you want to think about is definitely the size. Make sure your yard is big enough to handle whatever tree you'd like, but also think about how you'd like the shade. Would you like some dense shade like this ironwood tree would provide? At maturity, that one's going to be about 25 feet by 25 feet. In the early days, this one was actually considered a very slow growing tree, but after it started to get utilized more with regular irrigation, it's actually a fairly moderate growth tree. So you will end up with a good sized tree in a relatively short period of time. Think about another great one is the fruitless olive tree. So this one can actually think about when you're going back to thinking about themes, if the architecture around your house seems to be very Mediterranean in nature, look to the Mediterranean plants that actually do well here as some of your plant palette, like the fruitless olive. So these olive trees, they do not produce pollen, so they do not produce the olives. So without that pollen, you're not going to have to deal with those allergy issues. Think about some of our native things like our velvet mesquite out there. It's a very, very dense shade. It's a large tree, so make sure you do have room for it. And uh, it's a really, really great thing to use native species when possible because it does provide that food and habitat for our native birds. Another one that'll give you a very dense shade that a lot of people really like is the Indian rosewood. Uh, many people actually refer to this as one of the Latin names, which is the Sisu tree. And a lot of people that aren't really uh, appreciative of the form of a desert native tree like this one because it reminds them of more a traditional tree that you'll see in other climates of the country. So it's also got those nice green leaves as opposed, as opposed to the tiny little gray leaves that you'll see on some of our desert plants out there. And this is a tree that will survive in very, very tough conditions. Now for a few years now, this tree has actually gotten a bad rap and people will say, oh, that tree's horrible. It messes up your sidewalks and it, and it breaks water lines and things like that. Well, it has nothing to do at all with the species. It has to do with the fact that that is a very large tree. It doesn't matter what species it is. If you plant a very large tree three feet away from a sidewalk, at maturity, those roots are going to start damaging the sidewalk. Same with walls and patios and the like. If it's a very, very large tree with a very large root system and there are some water pipes that are in the way of that root development, no matter what species it is, you can run into those issues. So again, this is about a 40 foot by 40 foot tree, so definitely make sure you do have the room for it. You can also do a lot of species of trees out here that provide a more filtered shade. A great one is the Palo Blanco. This one gets about 20 feet tall, but the nice thing about it is, is it has a much more upright growth pattern. So it's only about 10 to 15 feet wide. So it actually works very, very well in some of those smaller yards out there. 
A wonderful feature of this tree is when it's young, it's got that very papery shaggy bark, but at maturity it stops shedding that papery bark off there and you end up with a very stark white trunk, which viewed at night under lighting is a very, very dramatic impact. Another great tree that will provide us some filtered shade is the mulga tree. This one is also one of your trees that work very well in the smaller areas. It's only going to get about 12 foot by 9 foot according to our uh, information, although I've seen them bigger than that, but they uh, do grow relatively slowly. One of the great features you get out of this tree is you get those wonderful yellow flowers in the spring. That's a great thing about a lot of our trees out here is we actually have trees that provide beauty through flowers as opposed to other areas of the country where a tree is just green leaves and that's all you get. Another great tree for some filtered shade would be the hybrid Palo Verde, which has become very popular in the year since it was introduced. It's a pretty good sized tree though, so make sure you have the room for it, 25 foot by 25 foot. Provides those wonderful yellow Palo Verde flowers out there. Uh, it does have the litter issue when it is in bloom, so make sure you're not putting these next to a pool and then being mad at the tree. Another uh, variety of the Palo Verde, which is a fantastic one, is the blue Palo Verde. Uh, it's a little bit larger than the hybrid Palo Verde, but when this one is in bloom with those yellow flowers, there is no yellow that is more yellow anywhere in the world. That is a very, very striking yellow color on those blooms. So like I said, don't forget about the fact that we can do some seasonal color with the blooms on our trees, something we have a great advantage of here. A great one is the Cascalodi. It's a relatively small tree, but the wonderful thing about this particular tree is those blooms will actually happen in the winter time, typically starting right around January and into February before a lot of the other plant material is actually blooming. The desert willow is a fantastic tree. It's uh, that's a brand new one in the photo there, so it does get a lot larger than that, 25 foot by 20 feet, and you can get all those wonderful flower colors on there. And there are some different varieties on out there for this species of tree that'll have different characteristics like different flower colors. Now the desert willow does drop its leaves in the wintertime. It is deciduous, so if you want an evergreen tree in a certain location, this would not be the choice. The Catalpa is actually a cross between the desert willow and a Catalpa, which is a high water use tree from other areas of the country. Somebody crossed them together to try and get the beautiful uh, pale uh, pink flowers out there and still have it considered a low water use tree. There's a lot of debate in the uh, plant expert community as to whether this tree should have ever really been labeled as a low water use tree. And in our summer times, it does tend to get a lot of leaf scorch out there. So the way to try and keep this looking better is to remember it's going to need extra water in the summertime, as opposed to most of your other desert trees out there. Another great one is a Texas Mountain Laurel, especially for those smaller yards. This one is a very slow growing tree, so that tree there is probably about 10 to 12 years old. So in those smaller patio areas, this works really, really well. And the great thing about this tree is you get those clusters of those purple or lilac flowers there. And if you've ever been around one of these when they're in bloom, you'll never forget about it because they smell just like grape bubble gum. So let's take a look at some of our shrubs out there. So they're going to add our form, our texture, and our color. They're going to provide that seasonal impact. In this case, you've got that mass planting of those uh, Texas sages there that are pretty much just sitting there, not doing much until it becomes time to bloom. And then you've got that large area of bloom providing that wonderful season impact. So do remember your foundation plants in those areas where you want to just have something always there and then during its bloom season makes its impact. So one of my favorites is the desert honeysuckle. It's a medium sized shrub, but only about three foot by four foot. This one is a great attractor of both hummingbirds and butterflies. When it comes to butterflies, we do have a great butterfly bush here, different than the one that's grown back east. We call this one the woolly butterfly bush, but you'll see it has those nice composite flowers that do attract in the butterflies. It's a good sized shrub at five foot by five foot, so make sure you're putting it in the right location. A uh, good old fashioned favorite is the good old red bird of paradise. This plant, it's amazing how much color it will give you with how little water you give it. Once they get established, they require very, very little water and you get those wonderful, very impactful orange and yellow flowers on it. 
common one we see out there is the red fairy duster. It is a pretty good sized shrub at about five foot by five foot. So mind where you're putting it next to those walkways and things like that. This one is actually considered the Baja fairy duster with that nice red colored flower out there. The Sonoran designated version of this is a much more pale light pink colored flower. Good one is a little leaf cordia bush. This also is a pretty good size shrub at six foot by six foot, but it does provide those nice white flowers. And that's the thing is when you're looking for different flower colors out there, a lot of our desert plants seem to have yellow flowers. So providing another flower color such as these white flowers on the little leaf cordia gives you a little bit more diversity out there. Texas, Texas olive is a great one. Now this is considered a very, very large shrub at about 10 foot by 10 foot at maturity. And actually over the course of time, you can actually train this to up with some careful pruning to be almost like a small patio tree. So again, for those small patio landscapes where you want something that's kind of tree like, but you really don't have room for an actual tree, this is a fantastic option and it has those wonderful large white flowers on it. The black daily is more of a mounding shrub at about three foot high, but about four foot wide. And it has those lovely purple flowers on there, uh, deep purple flowers, a great attractor for uh, butterflies out there. The brittle bush. For many, many years, the nurseries were unable to grow this in production, but they finally did figure it out. So this is a true Arizona Sonoran Desert native plant and it has those wonderful composite flowers that bloom in the summertime and a great attractor for those butterflies. The emu bush is a great uh, uh, Australian native plant that works very, very well here. That one with those uh, really red flowers, a uh, very common uh, variety of that is actually called valentine bush, and that's because it blooms right around Valentine's Day, so a great way to provide that earlier uh, late winter to early spring color out there. Once again, a pretty good size shrub at about four foot by five foot, so give it room to grow. So it'll actually be covered in the flowers and the hummingbirds love this plant. Speaking of hummingbirds, the Chuparosa is a great plant. It is a Sonoran Desert native at about four feet by four feet, and it's got those lovely red tubular flowers that everyone thinks about when it comes to attracting those hummingbirds. And when it comes to attracting hummingbirds, Chuparosa in Spanish is the word for hummingbirds, so that gives you a real good clue as far as who likes this plant. Some of your good plants during most of the year, the fair little seasons are the John sages, your Texas sages, and things like this. The John sage is a little bit compact with the uh, Texas sages that were popular for some years. Well, the Texas sage can get up around six or seven or eight, even eight feet. This one's going to stay a little bit more compact for you at about four foot by five foot. And when the humidity levels increase during our summer monsoons, that's when you're going to see this one come into bloom. And this one happens to have those nice uh, light lilac colored flowers. Another great foundation plant is your Baja Ruelia. Once again, it's just a green plant out there, but it does bloom and it has those nice uh, purple flowers on that. And it's more of a medium sized shrub at about that three foot by four foot range. Now, when it comes to smaller ones, there's a different variety of Ruelli out there that's known as the Katy, and this one only gets to about one foot high by about two feet wide, and this one actually does quite well at blooming in some of that filtered shade where it's real hard to get coloring plants in those shady areas. This one does a great job of it. The Arizona Yellow Bells is a native to Arizona, but it's a uh, native in higher elevation where it's cooler and they get more rainfall. So with some supplemental uh, watering down here with our irrigation systems, they do quite well. They will actually tolerate some of those tougher locations in your yard, like that reflected heat. It is a large shrub. We say about six feet by six feet. Given enough time and left alone to do whatever it wants, it will actually get quite a bit larger than that. And over time with some careful pruning, I've actually seen them done where they're like small patio trees. But they've got those really, really large, very colorful yellow flowers bloom pretty much all summer long. A relative of the Arizona yellow bells is the orange bells. This is a cross of the Arizona yellow bells with another plant. We're not sure which one. The person who designed this one uh, isn't letting us know. Uh, this one, oops, I'm sorry. This one gets about eight foot by six foot. Um, and actually left to its own devices, it can get much larger than that. 
The ones at my house that I have shading my bedroom, I don't trim them except for when I really have to. And currently they're about 18 feet tall by about 12 feet wide. But I want them to be like that because they are providing that shade for my house. There are other varieties of the orange bells out there that are much more compact that'll stay in that four to five foot range for you. So definitely talk to your nursery professionals and check out that Arizona Municipal Water Users Association plants website, amwa.org slash plants. Okay, and you've got the toughest area in your yard and you want some plants out there and it might be an outlying area and you just really don't wanna put anything out there that takes anything for maintenance. One of the toughest plants in our desert is the creosote. So a lot of people wonder why this uh, particular plant is in this presentation. All oh, that horrible, nasty, wild creosote. Well, actually, when you've got those kind of locations where you don't really want to have to mess with the plant or do anything to take care of it, finding those tough bulletproof plants is a great way to do it. And actually, when people come here and they talk about that wonderful smell in the desert after a rain, the creosote bush is actually what's doing that. So when the raindrops are hitting the uh, resin on the leaves of this shrub, that's what makes that desert rain smell. Pretty good size. It does have some small yellow flowers on it, but nothing too dramatic. So let's talk about some vines out there. Vines are a great way to add some color. They also will soften those prison yard walls that we have around all our backyards, so we don't want to be looking at those ugly block walls. They'll add some vertical interest, but you do want to pay attention how the different vines will climb, whether they're self-attaching or they need some support like a trellis. So a great one out there is the yellow orchid vine. Gets about 15 feet by 15 feet. Got these creamy yellow flowers on there, so it uh, really does add some nice color. Got that nice yellow color in there. Another great one is a good native plant. It's our queen's wreath, and this one will get quite large over the course of time. Has those wonderful red uh, draping clusters of flowers. So a lot of people uh, from other areas of the country look at this and tend to think of those bleeding hearts that they're used to. One thing to know about the queen's wreath, however, is this is a deciduous vine, which means in the wintertime it'll drop its leaves and then you just have the bare sticks on there. A great way to deal with this is to plant this on the same wall, on the same trellis with another vine that does not lose its leaves. So that way it'll be covered up in the winter time and then the next summer when the queens restarts uh, producing and growing again, then it'll start giving you these wonderful sprays of those red flowers. Lilac vine, in this instance, we're showing it in a very small container up on a wall. It does need to be trellised, so you'll see where it kind of twines around the trellis there. Actually put in the ground and put up against a large wall, it will cover a good size wall at about 15 feet by 10 feet. There's also a lot of people refer to this as a purple lilac vine, but there is also a white variety if that was a different color you'd prefer. If you've got a really large area you want to cover and you want some nice showy flowers out there, a great uh, solution for this is the pink trumpet vine. Uh, it does need to be supported on a trellis and it is a big heavy vine, so make sure that trellis is nice and sturdy. We say about 20 feet by 10 feet left to its own devices and allowed to grow without any pruning, it can actually cover much more than that. So if you've got a large wall in your backyard that you want covered with only a couple of vines, this one would be a great option. So there's a lot of different accent plants we use out there. So they do provide some of that wonderful striking forms. They focus the eye. Now many of these are spiny or thorny, so do be careful about the placement. Don't put them too close to the walkways. So a great one is our good old fashioned desert spoon. It's about four foot by four foot and it does quite well in those filtered shade areas and you can see that dappled sunlight coming down on this plant from that tree up above it. And as the wind blows, it creates actually movement for the eye that attracts, uh, uh, attracts your vision and your focal point. A lot of people do like the agaves out there, but a lot of them are very, very large and you may not have the space for it. So a great option is the Perry's agave. It stays pretty small at mature size at about three feet by three feet. It's got that nice tight uh, cluster of uh, the rosette uh, leaves there. Some of your larger agaves out there that really have a big bold impact are things like your Weber's agave. That's a pretty good size plant at about six foot by six foot and it really does have those sharp points on the end. So do keep it away from the walkways. 
but when it's mixed in with uh, some other plants, it does quite well where it's sitting in among some bear grass or some deer grass there. A very popular one for many years has been the octopus agave, about four foot by five foot. Still has those nice arcing, graceful uh, gray green leaves out there, and it does produce a wonderful flower stalk when it does come time to bloom. Some of the smaller areas, you may want to consider some of the smaller aloes, such as this medicinal aloe, only about two foot by five foot. And by five foot, we mean that's about as tall as the flower stalk gets, not necessarily the, not necessarily the plant itself. This is another great one for adding in that winter color because a lot of your aloes like this will start blooming in about that January time frame and bloom out into March and maybe even into April. Very, very common one we see out there is the red yucca. We say about three foot by five foot, and we really mean that. So you'll see, unfortunately, in this particular picture, somebody placed that plant far too close to that driveway and sidewalk. So now they're just gonna have to keep trimming and trimming that plant to keep it off the walkway and the driveway. And that's really not the effect you wanna get out of this plant. It has those nice draping, arcing branches there. That's what you wanna get. And of course, it has the wonderful tall flower stalks with those uh, pink flowers on there. There is also a yellow variety. So if you're doing a group planting of these and you wanna make sure you're getting all the same flower color, you may wanna pick them out at the nursery when they're in flower so you don't end up with four red ones and one yellow one. We see that happen in landscapes often. If you've really got the room for it, a really nice striking form plant is the giant Hesperello at about five feet by five feet. This one gets really, really big and it provides some great impact and drama in the landscape, especially if it's kind of in front of a wall and you can light it up with some uh, low voltage lighting at night to not only light up the plant, but to cast the shadow on the wall behind it. So if you're thinking about doing some uh, night lighting out there for your landscape, definitely work with somebody who is a good uh, qualified professional that isn't gonna just start throwing a bunch of lights in the yard. You wanna actually use them for real reasons like uh, casting these shadows. The bear grass is a wonderful plant out there. It's a very, very rigid type of grass. It's kind of raspy, so do keep it away from the walkways out there. This one's gonna get about three foot by four foot. And my puppy, when she was a puppy, she looked like a little baby bear. And I wasn't about to just name a dog bear. That's just way too boring. So I named her after the Latin name for this plant. So my dog's name was Nolina microcarpa. So let's talk about some of the perennials we can use in our yards out there. So they can do a lot of splashes of color, usually very seasonal, very short lived. Uh, these types of plants are usually very good at reseeding themselves as well. So if you are using these types of plants, we're going to allow them to die off and then reseed. That's usually how the process works. They spread their seeds after the plant dies. Be very careful where you're using them so you don't get in trouble with your HOA. So you might want to keep some of these in the backyard so you're not going to get those letters. A real great one out there that stays in those nice small areas, only about one foot by two foot, works really well in group plantings, is the Blackfoot Daisy. Another good one is the Tufted Evening Primrose, about one foot by two foot. And this is another thing to think about when you're doing your design of your area. In those entertainment areas, you tend to do those in the evening. The wonderful thing about this plant is it does open up its flowers at night. They're the nice white flowers, so they're very visible. Usually in the summertime, by about seven o'clock in the morning, those flowers have already folded up and closed. There is a Mexican evening primrose out there that is a wonderful spreading ground cover type plant out there. However, you'll see in this picture, it's actually beginning to take over that front yard. It's climbing through, up and over and around all the other plant material there. So if you are gonna use this one, you may wanna be careful and put it in a location where it's surrounded by hardscape so you can keep it contained to one specific area. The Mexican bush sage is another great plant. This is more of an upright shrub, about four foot by four foot. It's got those wonderful purple calyxes on there and the small white flowers coming out from there. Wonderful attractor of both hummingbirds and butterflies. The rain lily is a great one, one foot by one foot. And you can see you can kind of put these small little plants next to your rocks, larger rocks and boulders you may put out there. So it looks a lot more natural than a lot of these yards where you'll see they pay a lot of money for a boulder. And all they do is they kind of drop it on the ground 
and that's it. Whereas if you put some of these smaller plants up next to it, it's going to look a lot more natural and not so uh, 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 arbitrarily placed. So these are about one foot by one foot. They actually do fairly well at blooming in some shady areas, and you have lots of different uh, options as far as uh, flower colors on these. So when it comes to planting these, this is a sign at the Mesa Community College Xeriscape Demonstration Garden. This is not just about planting shade trees, though. This is about any of your plants. In the old days, it was always dig the hole twice as deep and twice as wide. Unfortunately, what happens when you do that is after that ground begins to settle and recompact itself, now your plants and your trees are sinking down into the ground and the dirt fills back in at that spot where the roots become the trunk or the main stem of the shrub or tree. And at that point, that's what's called the root crown. You do not want to bury the root crown. That will eventually kill the plant. It doesn't happen overnight, but it will eventually happen. So now what you want to do is dig the hole for your plants only as deep as the root ball that it comes from the nursery container in, and you want to dig the hole three to five times as wide. So that way you're going to really help the roots of that plant or that tree become established. One thing you don't want to do is mix in any kind of organic matter in your backfill. You want to use the native desert soil in your yard for that backfill. Otherwise, you've got an extra type of soil texture where that transition between the two of them are going to have to have those roots penetrate. So use those organic mulches in your flower beds and your vegetable gardens. That's where they belong. When it comes to pruning, there are certain reasons to prune trees. Dead branches, diseased branches, crossing branches that are rubbing on one another, and that's it unless it's next to a walkway and you've got a safety issue where somebody's going to bang their head and get hurt. When it comes to pruning your shrubs, there are some reasons there. Controlling the form, but not necessarily with those head shears where you're turning it into strange forms, and to control the size. So some of our plants will say they get about six feet by six feet, but again, those Texas sages can get much larger. So Every few years or so, you may want to do what's called a reduction or rejuvenation pruning, where you prune it back really, really hard, and it's scary because there's only some sticks coming out of the ground at that point. A well-established plant that will tolerate that type of uh, rejuvenation pruning will come back to life and fill in on a nice new uh, growth habit really, really quickly. So when it comes to pruning, definitely don't abuse your plants and don't insult them either. That poor cactus just lost all his self-esteem. So when it comes to pruning trees, what you do want to do is make sure you're leaving at least the top two thirds of the tree in canopy. Obviously, this is not proper tree pruning and those trees did not survive. They were gone within two months of that summer when they were first planted. So once again, somebody convinced somebody to prune their trees like this. This is what we call lion tailing where the foliage is left only at the very, very ends of the branches. And unfortunately, what that is doing is it's making the top of the tree catching all the weight and the wind, which makes them more susceptible to falling over. People will try and do this saying, well, now the wind can pass through the tree during our summer storms, so it's going to help it survive better. It's actually making it worse. And in this particular commercial location, that's a very large liability where that tree could fall on somebody or somebody's car. So when we talk about where to cut the trees, you want to make sure you're pruning at the right location. So what you have here is using your, uh, uh, a lot of your trees will actually tell you where to prune by having this bark, branch bark ridge up on top where you've got that little bit of extended growth out there. And down on the bottom, you'll see in the blue where it's uh, showing you the branch collar. Now on this left branch coming off the tree, it's a very large branch, so you don't want to just take it with one cut because as you get halfway through that branch, the weight of it is going to break it off and it's going to tear the bark all the way down the side of the tree. So you're actually going to use three cuts on this where the first cut is going to be about 12 to 14 inches out from the trunk on the underside, about a third to a half of the way through there. Then the second cut is going to be further out on the limb on the top side and once you get partially through there, the weight of the branch will break it off. But because you've already done that undercut, it's not going to peel the bark back at you. Now that the weight has been removed, you can do the final cut. 
What you don't want to do are the examples shown with those dotted lines on the right side is leave those stubs out there. You're opening up for infection and disease and insects. Same thing as if you trim it too closely. The tree will not be able to compartmentalize itself from the wound and you're just inviting issues with disease and insect infestation. This particular one on that branch coming off to the right, you see those kind of uh, ridges coming off there on the top. The tree is actually telling you where it wants to be cut. You do end up with some tough decisions out there, unfortunately, sometimes like in this case. The connection on these two main trunks there are way too tight and as they grow, they're going to grow into one another. They don't grow together, they grow into one another, so they're not actually attached in there. That's what we call included bark. So one of the things we could do with this tree is at this point try and decide which part we want to save. I would probably say the uh, uh, one coming up on the left there, or if the tree is that young, first of all, I wouldn't have accepted that tree from the nursery to begin with, but uh, if the tree is that young, you may decide it's just not worth it and you can just go ahead and replace it at this point. But if you do nothing sooner or later, this, oops, this is what's going to happen. That trunk is going to split right down the middle and now you have no tree. When it comes to pruning shrubs, we do want to remind you that that high maintenance shearing increases the water needs. It's going to stimulate all that new succulent growth because you've removed the food making capability of the plant and it is going to go into accelerated growth mode trying to grow back its ability to make food. It's going to open up wounds. It's going to remove the shade from your stems, trunks and roots, and it is actually slow motion starvation of the plants. And some plants do tolerate that type of sh uh, shearing better than others. Some are well suited to those formal hedges if that's what you want. So make sure you choose your plants accordingly. So when it comes to your pruning your shrubs, let them show their stuff. This is a shrub. Now this may be a little too wild and crazy for some people's taste, but with just a few snips of your hand pruners, this can be brought back to a much more controlled form, but still have that natural shape of the plant. So this is a shrub's flower. That's one of the things we see with the people that share their plants, which is unusual because most people will choose one plant over another on the basis of the color of the flowers. Then after they plant them a few years later, they get up to whatever size it may be for the area. And then after that, they completely shear off all the flowers. That was the whole point of putting the plant in to begin with. So another thing to think about is timing of when you're doing this pruning, especially if you are wanting to do some of these formal hedges, definitely know the bloom season. So we've got that nice hedge of the uh, uh, bougainvilleas along the front of that uh, commercial building there. So it looks like they're doing a pretty good job, except for when I turn my head to the left, what I realized is they had just not finished their trim job for the week. They had gotten the left side of that property done, but not the right side. So would you prefer this or this? Personally, I'd prefer the one where the plants are in bloom. So one of the things we also have to remember with that shearing is it makes a lot of waste that needs to be disposed of. Whether you've got your uh, bulk waste here in Gilbert, uh, bulk trash pickup, or uh, green barrels in other areas, but all that shearing, you can see those bags of all that material that just needs to be hauled away. So the use of some hand pruners to bring shrubs back into form, you're going to create a lot less waste. It's actually going to create a lot less time and be a lot easier to clean up. So here we have a petite oleander. It's got some wild and crazy branches sticking out of it. But instead of going crazy with the head shears with less than 10 cuts and very little waste to remove, and notice they are large pieces that we've cut off. So you don't have all those tiny little pieces that you end up with when you do that uh, head shearing out there. And you can see that plant has been brought back into a nice natural but controlled form. And you'll notice one other thing this shrub has. It still has its flowers. So let's play a couple neat games here. What shape is this plant? Left to its own devices, many of our shrubs will naturally grow in a fairly round shape, maybe just a few wild branches here and there that need to be trimmed off. However, what shape is this plant? You'll see that years of that shearing, the inside of the plant is no longer getting any sun, so all you have is a very thin edge of foliage on the very outside of that plant. So 
that's just not a very happy or healthy looking plant. And when that plant is in bloom, it is so covered in yellow flowers, you don't even really see the plant itself. Now, once again, this plant may be a little bit more wild and crazy than some people prefer, but again, with just a couple of cuts with some hand pruning tools, whether it's your hand pruners or your loppers for your larger branches, can be brought back into shape fairly quickly. Whereas the shape of these plants, this is what we say when we've seen the cupcake crew come through. So whoever did this is probably very proud of themselves about how evenly and uniform they got all of those poor little cupcakes. But the really unfortunate thing about that is those are not shrubs. Those are mastic trees that have been turned into small sheared shrubs. What shape are these plants? Well, fire plug comes to mind and you can see already a few of them are on their last legs or already dead. And speaking of fire plugs, I hope when the fire department, if they ever need to show up to this location, they don't get confused by what they should hook up their fire hoses to. They want to make sure they hook it up to the fire plug itself. And you can see one of them has already been maintained to death. The other thing where we're talking about where the shrubs only have that very thin coverage of foliage on the very outside of the plants when it comes to shearing, if you ever do have a branch that dies back, it accidentally gets broken by somebody knocking into it, or it just dies from whatever causes. When you have to remove that dead branch, you end up with the shape of this plant, which is referred to as the Arizona igloo. Now this one is a great one. What shape is this plant? Now you got to give credit to the skill and talent of the person that is doing this to the tree, but unfortunately that is a tree or actually it is no longer a tree, it is just a giant shrub. And once again, this is another piece of artwork that somebody has done with their shrubs. And again, you got to give them credit for the talent and the skill to do that. But sooner or later, if they have a branch die back there, their, their poor little bird is going to have a giant gaping hole in there. So we hope hope we helped you uh, think about some of the things you're going to do with your plant choices out there. If you do have more questions, feel free to email us at water.conservation at gilbertaz.gov. We are also having some live question and answer sessions based on the four videos that we have posted right now. So you can find those at gilbertaz.gov slash water workshops. On Thursday, October 22nd at 10 o'clock, we're going to answer questions from people that have watched this video and the one on attracting uh, hummingbirds and butterflies with plants. On Thursday, October 29th at 10 o'clock a.m., we're going to have another live question and answer session where you can ask, ask questions to a live member of the conservation staff. And that one's going to be taking in questions about the other two videos that we have listed on our website, which is about how to water your landscape and how to program those controllers.